nature-based solutions have the potential to address many sustainability challenges that cities face today. They can, for instance, help us address climate change impacts like floods, heat waves, drought, windstorms and landslides. But how can nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation be mainstreamed in urban governance and planning? First, we need to understand what is adaptation mainstreaming. Then we can add nature-based solutions to the equation. In simple terms, adaptation mainstreaming refers to the inclusion of climate adaptation considerations into sector policy and practice in order to reduce climate risk. The concept has mainly two origins. On the one hand, it developed from risk reduction mainstreaming, which has been strongly promoted since the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Kobe in 2005, and which builds on mainstreaming experience in other cross-cutting or mainstreaming domains like HIV AIDS and gender. On the other hand, it originates in environmental policy integration and more specifically climate policy integration, which has been promoted since around 1997. The initial objective of climate policy integration was to integrate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions into other sectoral policies, but the focus has gradually broadened and nowadays also includes adaptation considerations. So why is knowledge on mainstreaming relevant for supporting nature-based solutions? Well, it is because although nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation are widely advocated, they have so far not been implemented systematically. And it remains widely unclear to many local authorities and other stakeholders what they can do to change the situation that is, to mainstream this new approach into their daily work. So how can nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation be systematically mainstreamed into urban planning and governance? At the local level, mainstreaming requires the consideration and combination of four types of measures to reduce climate risk. First, we can either reduce or avoid hazard exposure. The aim here is to keep climate hazards away from human settlements by not moving into hazard areas or reducing hazard exposure on site. Second, we can reduce the vulnerability of the area that is exposed to the climate hazard. Here, we are not trying to keep the hazard away from human settlements. Instead, we create an environment that is able to live with hazards without losing its main functions. Third, we can ensure an effective response to climate hazards. Here, we prepare response mechanisms and structures before a potential hazard strikes. And finally, the fourth type of measure aims to ensure effective recovery from the impacts of a hazard. Here, we need to prepare recovery mechanisms and structures again before a potential hazard strikes. Depending on the climate hazard, the specific activities can change, but conceptually speaking, the four types of measures do not change. So what would be some concrete examples for nature-based solutions? Well, there are ample examples from the Urban Transformation Projects at Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. We can, for instance, avoid hazard exposure through the establishment of nature protection areas or parks designed to inhibit the development of housing and risk areas. We can reduce exposure to floods, as well as reduce erosion through beach nourishment, restoring or managing mangroves, or improving water management in the outskirts of urban areas. In the case of landslides, we can stabilize the slope by planting new trees to hold the soil in place. Regarding vulnerability reduction to floods, examples are the creation of buffer zones, retention ponds, or increasing the extent of permeable surfaces, for instance, through the promotion of green roofs, urban agriculture, or greening laneways. Regarding vulnerability reduction to heat, there is the use of drought-resistant plants and improved thermal insulation, for instance, through green walls. 
Another important element of vulnerability reduction is including redundant elements in urban design to reduce dependency on only one urban system, for instance, heating, transportation or drainage systems, where green infrastructure can provide redundancy. When it comes to response preparedness measures, one of the most typical measures are early warning systems and preparations for temporary refuge. Here, properly designed green areas can provide space for temporary shelter or temporary protection if necessary, for example, elevated green platforms during flash floods. Another example is the preparation of mechanisms or structures that provide cooling, for instance, through mobile planting systems or fountains, which can be used during heat waves. When it comes to recovery preparedness, an example is to use green infrastructure elements that can easily recover or be replaced after climate impacts. In addition, we can prepare for post-disaster assistance. For example, we can stipulate green areas that can be used for accommodation during reconstruction and prepare to clear or reuse rubble, including green material. In the recovery context, support for greening private lots is an example of a multi-purpose measure with positive impacts on health and psychology. Other preparedness measures are awareness raising campaigns and guidance on what to do after certain climate events, which can, for instance, be displayed in so-called climate parks. But why is it important to know and ultimately address all four measures through nature-based solutions. It is important because local climate resilience depends on the level of inclusiveness and flexibility of the combined set of adaptation measures employed rather than the effectiveness of a single measure or activity. By inclusiveness, I mean the use of not just one or two, but all of the four adaptation measures. Flexibility relates to the number and diversity of activities implemented for each type of measure, which have to include both grey and green infrastructure approaches, as well as social and economic measures. But sustainable change will remain elusive as long as our understanding of mainstreaming remains naive. Organizations themselves need to change rather than simply mainstreaming change in selected on-the-ground activities. In fact, all of the examples I have mentioned so far apply to the local or operational level. But if we want to assure their sustainable implementation, there must also be changes at the institutional and interinstitutional levels. This requires us to apply a set of mainstreaming strategies. Their aim is to institutionalize adaptation and nature-based approaches so that their integration at local level becomes a standard procedure, including monitoring and the creation of structures for learning. The mainstreaming strategies also aim to ensure that organizations themselves can continue to function during climate change impacts. Finally, they support the creation of a multi-level governance system for adaptation and nature-based approaches that includes citizens and, where possible, drive improved education on mainstreaming as well as related science policy integration. Put together, there are a total of six mainstreaming strategies that operate at three levels, the local, the institutional and the interinstitutional level. These six strategies need to be combined to enable the sustainable integration of nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation. The first two strategies focus on the local or household level and relate to how the four types of measures can be integrated in on-the-ground initiatives. This can be done by adding such measures to the implementing body sector work or by modifying it in such a way that it also addresses risk. Three mainstreaming strategies focus on the institutional level. They address the implementing body's internal organization and cooperation, as well as its policies and regulations to ensure, rather than hamper, the implementation of nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation. This can include the modification of 
working structures, mandates, job descriptions, the configuration of sections or departments, as well as personal and financial assets. It also involves the modification of formal and informal planning strategies and frameworks, regulations and related instruments. The sixth mainstreaming strategy focuses on the inter-institutional level. It addresses external cooperation with other governmental and non-governmental organizations, educational and research bodies and the general public to generate shared understanding and knowledge develop competence and steer collective issues of climate change adaptation and nature-based solutions. This involves the modification of public interventions and policies to both support and complement citizens' and private actors' adaptation efforts. Mainstreaming thus needs to take place at all three levels the local, institutional and interinstitutional level in order to achieve sustainable change. To sum up, the three key messages are as follows. First, mainstreaming nature-based approaches for climate change adaptation requires the combination of four types of measures to reduce climate risk at the local level. These measures should consider not only the reduction of climate risk, but also other sustainability challenges. Second, their sustainable implementation requires the combination of mainstreaming strategies at the local, institutional and interinstitutional level. And third, taken together, these measures and strategies have the potential to foster resilience by challenging common attitudes and paradigms at multiple levels of governance. Therefore, mainstreaming nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation can be seen as an important pathway to foster urban resilience.